Hello again. I'm Mr. G, and I'm so glad you're here because I'm about to work my magic on this film right here, Marvel's The Eternals. It's not exactly Avengers Endgame, folks, but that's okay. We're going to work our magic today to turn this mediocre at best movie into something a lot more compelling. So let me start conjuring up my mystic arts, and I'm going to say the magic words here. Aole pilikia, he petach. Oh, college board. We got one Eternals movie here, and we got one Eternals movie over here. What kind of sorcery is this? And better yet, why didn't the executives at Marvel think of this? Greetings, fellow fans of pop culture, and welcome to the Revision Challenge, a special YouTube series where we make movies better by adding extra scenes to enhance either characterization or plot. And you can only find it on Mr. G's Pop Culture Academy. I am absolutely thrilled that you're here with us. And before we get started, if you are simply auditing this class, which is to say you're viewing this film and you're not sure whether you should subscribe or not, please subscribe, please like, please share. And also, since I'm using this as a mechanism to teach my students how to use videography, if there's any ways in which I can improve, please also let me know. So today's video, the inaugural video of the Revision Challenge deals with the Eternals. Now, real quick, we're gonna talk about this a little bit. This is one part review, one part creative writing assignment. What we're dealing with here, folks, is we're examining the strengths and weaknesses of a show, or in this case, a movie, and explaining how very specific scenes could be used to make the story better. So with that in mind, why does Marvel's The Eternals qualify as a good candidate for the revision challenge? Well, it starts with this, folks. It starts with this. It has what I call Black Widow Syndrome. It's a really bad case of Black Widow Syndrome. And it's so named Black Widow Syndrome because I had the exact same problem with Black Widow. You have too much plot and not enough characterization to make the story work. Now, Black Widow actually does a better job and is a more effective movie than The Eternals because at least with Black Widow, you know the protagonist. We wish we knew more about her, but you know the protagonist. Where this really sinks with The Eternals is that you have absolutely no idea who these characters are. And over the course of almost three hours in the original version of The Eternals, you have to build the characterizations of 10 different people over the course of three hours. And that, that's too big an ask. So we are going to split up Marvel's The Eternals into two movies. And this is how it works, folks. Let's take a real quick look. Eternals 1, The Dawn of Time. The three act structure goes like this, folks. Act one is when you introduce your characters. So let's take a look at that. Let's really introduce our characters here. Let's take a look at all the characters and see how they interact with the early forms of humanity. We see glimpses of this in the actual movie. Let's expand on that a little bit. Let's expand on the relationship between Cersei and, goodness, I forgot even his name, Icarus. Let's talk about that. The fact that I forget these characters' names, folks, is not my fault. It is a demonstration of how little these people are developed as characters. So the purpose of Eternal's Dawn of Time is to build those characters. What makes Ajax Ajax? What makes Icarus Icarus? Let's expand a little bit on the psyche of Sprite. They did a really good job developing Sprite's character in the first in the original movie. Her and Cersei are pretty much the only two characters that are fully fleshed out amongst the other, what, 10 that they featured. But what makes this person tick some more? Why does it bother Sprite that she can't age? Examine that some more. Have some interesting discussions amongst early men where she explains how and why she can't age. Talk about that. For the character who signs, a very good addition that is extremely empowering, but you could do a lot more with that character, folks. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about how these characters evolve and what makes them tick. In the case of the character who signs and only signs, 
how would this character relate to a, a culture, perhaps a Polynesian culture, Hawaii definitely comes to mind, where hand gestures and body movements are an equally access, acceptable form of communication um, as spoken word. You could have some fun with that. If you wanted, you could say that this eternal helps set the standard for that culture. The fact that she communicates through hand gestures inspires these cultures to do the same. You could do that, you might send the wrong message though. You could also have an equally more powerful story um, interaction in which this character who can only communicate through hand gestures and stuff like that, sign language, not really explained in the story, by the way, and this new version of the story would explain how and why that is. And you would have this character and her affection for humanity grow because she finds belonging in these indigenous communities, these communities where they speak through their hands in addition to their mouths. That would be phenomenal. And over the course of that first act, you could have the fall of Babylon and have that colossal and climactic destruction of a major and advanced city state be the framework for explaining this sort of prime directive that the Eternals have to follow of non-interference. They can only kill the deviants. They can't interfere in people's affairs. And this could set in the minds of certain characters, certain Eternals, this sort of conflict of we were ordered to do this, but because of the affection that we have for these people, we can't stand by and let all this um, work that we've done and all these lives be, uh, be destroyed, be suffer, all those sorts of things. That would be, I'm getting excited about this because this is far more exciting than the actual movie. That would be a lot more compelling and a lot more engaging than what we actually got. So then you go on to the act two and you talk about the deviants becoming more aggressive. They inherit some sort of mutation that makes them more difficult to defeat. And this is where you can have some fun and you can kind of show something that was only told in the original movie. They make reference to Icarus, which is an ancient myth of a man who flies too close to the sun, his wings melt and he falls into the ocean and dies. You could have fun with that in a way that shows instead of tells. You could have Icarus fight one of these flying deviants, go close to the sun, and the deviant unleashes its new power that Icarus doesn't know about, gets wounded, and falls into the ocean. And then in a very quick scene, you could have a situation where the people who witnessed this event start talking about the myth of Icarus. You could do that, but that establishes the tension in the second act. This concept, folks, that, oh my gosh, the deviants are getting stronger and we don't know why. Have that culminate in the third act. So all of this sets up for the third act. You have these deviants that have all these kinds of powers that no one can understand. It's a sort of mutation to their powers. And then you have Fastus, the man who is a technological genius, help build something, some sort of eternal technology that helps them fight um, these deviants. And all of this culminates in the third act in Tenochtitlan, where you have a climactic battle in which this new technology that Fastus makes is used by the Eternals and the deviants are destroyed. But in the same time, you have a situation where Tenochtitlan and the Aztecs also fall to the Spaniards. This sets up the kind of conflict that you see in the movie, and that results in the D, excuse me, the eternal splitting ways. That could 100% work, and that could have been a perfectly acceptable end to the first movie. The fact that they didn't do that, folks, is kind of mind-boggling to me. So you could have some different things. You could have an Easter egg that sets up something else in phase four, if you like. And that's the end of it, um, Eternals, Dawn of Time. Then you take a look at Eternals 2 coming out like two years later. We call it Eternals 2, Emergence. Act one, you fast forward to modern time. You do a little recap, perhaps before the Marvel's credits, about what happened in the first Eternals. 
Then you bring it to modern day and you have all these different scenarios. You got Cersei with, with Kit Harrington. Um, you have um, the movie star. Once again, not my fault, but I don't remember these characters' names. They were not memorable in the original movie. Um, you have Sprite still doing battle with um, the fact that Sprite doesn't age. All these different people. And this culminates in the second act where... Once again, the deviants have returned, but they've mutated once more. And you have this kind of argument. You have these kinds of fights. You have all this climactic stuff involving the double cross that Icarus does. Then this culminates in the climactic battle like before. Once again, you take what the movie we got and you split them up into two movies. If you had done that, this serves two purposes. First of all, from an artistic standpoint, it improves the characters. You understand how they operate, why they operate, and when you do a really good job with characterization, you know what each and every one of them would do in any given situation. For example, I absolutely love Iron Man. He's my favorite Avenger ever. And I know almost in any given situation what Iron Man or Tony Stark would do. I could not tell you what any of these other characters would do, all the other Eternals. Maybe other than Sprite and Fastus, I don't know what the other Eternals would do. The movie suffers immensely for that. And I honestly believe that if they had two movies to explain these characters and their interactions and the broader storyline, instead of one big movie, but two smaller movies, that would have been so much better. And, and this makes the, um, the bean counters at Disney happy, a lot more profitable because two movies and two box office returns. There you go. But what do you think? How would you, if given the opportunity and all the money in the world, fix or revise Eternals? Or do you think it's good the way it is? I'm very curious to hear your thoughts. Let me know in the comments below. And if there's another movie out there you'd like to see me do uh, the revision challenge for, please let me know. I got a lot of other movies planned for this um, series. So with that said, um, live long and prosper. And remember, there is no fate but what we make for ourselves. Till next time. Hello again. Thanks for watching that video. With that said, feel free to tune in every Movie Monday for new materials, and let me know what you think. I'm absolutely excited to hear your thoughts. Live long and prosper. May the Force be with you, and there is no faith but what we make for ourselves.